from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the Southern Oregon Television Award for Program of the Year and the Award for Best Educational Program. I'm the host and producer, John Letts. Ramping Up Your English is an educational support program for intermediate English learners. It's a program for people from all language backgrounds. Ramping Up Your English is also for people of all ages. If you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English, and you want to reach higher levels of proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Animals. This is segment one of episode 61. In our last episode, we dove into the world of invertebrates, like this colorful, graceful organism that belongs to the animal kingdom, a coral. This beautiful sea creature has no backbone and is made up of individual living units called polyps. This lack of a backbone is what classifies a highly divergent set of animals together as invertebrates. That's what sets them apart from other orders of animals. In this episode, I'll keep some promises I made. See, I promised to return to one of the reptiles we saw earlier, and I promised to have us look at the reproduction of butterflies. Let's start with that one. Butterflies like this one are pollinators in the adult phase of their life cycles. They seek the sweet nectar contained in flowers. This quest has them carrying pollen from flower to flower, pollinating the plant so they can continue their own life cycle. So we all admire the butterfly in its adult stage, both for its critical role as a pollinator and for the beautiful color and graceful flight with which it blesses our world. We're not all that crazy about the same animal in its other stages, especially the larva stage. A caterpillar does one thing and does it well. It eats. It's taking life energy from the host plant to fuel its growth into other phases of its life cycle. Now, if that's your favorite plant that it devours, you may have some unkind words to say in your native language about caterpillars. Well, as we watch the movements of this spiky caterpillar, note the leaf in the background. There's a big chunk eaten out of it. Looking for more as we consider this caterpillar began as an egg and is no doubt moving toward its next meal. There's even a children's book entitled The Hungry Caterpillar. An adult caterpillar laid her eggs on this plant so the caterpillar could do what caterpillars do, eat. Now, caterpillars go through complete metamorphosis. Like other insects, they begin as an egg. Most of the eggs will never make it to the next stage because something else will eat them. That's the way it works. Now, um, the eggs that survive hatch into tiny caterpillars, and they start eating immediately. And thus, they start growing and passing through numerous instars until they reach the size that you saw in the video. Now, do you remember from the darkling beetles which stage follows the larva stage? Let's see what happens to the caterpillar after eating and eating. The caterpillar attaches itself to a branch or other object and changes again like the darkling beetle we saw in the last episode. The caterpillar passes into the pupa stage. For butterflies, we call this the chrysalis stage. Let's watch this amazing time-lapse video that shows what happens in this life cycle. This is a monarch caterpillar. Remember, this is time-lapse videography. It doesn't happen this fast in nature. See it forming the chrysalis? This is the pupa stage. This is the chrysalis. Now watch it change over time. Notice the color change and the, the, the color you see behind that membrane. Now as we zoom out, watch what happens. 
There it emerges, and now it spreads its wings, and it's an adult butterfly. That's from a video sharing service called Videoblocks. Most of the video you see in this episode was purchased from them. Now, some of the video is from independent producers who license under Creative Commons, like I do uh, with this program, Ramping Up Your English. So to continue on, while a caterpillar's job is to eat, the butterfly's job is to mate. Now, some only live a few days as an adult, and some species don't eat anything at all. Most drink nectar to fuel the process of reproduction. Now, monarch butterflies undertake a long-distance migration, bringing them en masse to coastal California and Michoacan, Mexico. They gather in these places to reproduce by laying their eggs. Now, when those offspring reach maturity, they return to where their parents once lived. But now the parents have all died. They return to a place they've never been before. The mass migration of monarchs is one of the wonders of nature. Speaking of wonders of nature, I always told my students in elementary school that there are great rewards in observing nature, but you have to do it at nature's pace to get the full benefit. It takes effort in our fast-paced world to observe nature's processes, but the rewards go deep. Now, if you know how to look, you'll find that you're surrounded by nature no matter where you live, and the excitement of your own discovery cannot be equaled without that patient observation. I'm very happy to share images that I can share on this program, but it's no substitute for personal observation. Now, one thing you might see is a butterfly collecting nectar. Whether migrating or not, butterflies need energy for their reproductive functions and possibly just to enjoy being alive. Notice the round object near the mouth of this butterfly. That's a proboscis. The butterfly uses this tube to reach the nectar in a flower, then coils it up to stay out of the way when no longer needed. There are many different species of butterfly. As for the range of any given species, that depends on the species. Now, some are adaptable and live in a wide range of areas. Some are very specific about what they'll eat and can only be found in a rare habitat. These are the butterflies that are at the greatest risk of extinction. So this butterfly needs to live in a swampy area. They're not likely to be in a desert. You're not likely to see one there. Yet other species of butterflies are found in the desert. They're found there. Now, butterflies use their wings to cool off. And since insects are not warm-blooded, they depend on their environment to find warmth. That's why butterflies are sometimes seen sunning themselves. To cool themselves, they can release that heat through their wings, you know, when they're flapping them like that. So butterflies have been observed digging in the dirt, and that's probably to get minerals they need from the soil. These butterflies were observed digging in the mud at Maloney Springs in Upper Klamath Lake. Again, it looks like they're after minerals in the soil. Now, we can also see how they interact with each other in this situation. Monarch butterflies are widely distributed but endangered. They need a specific plant on which to lay their eggs. That plant is the milkweed. Now, many of them have been eliminated, those plants have been eliminated through the use of herbicides by farmers. The milkweed is not the threat to the crops, thus they are not the target of the herbicide spraying. Nonetheless, they are eliminated when the herbicides are sprayed on other unwanted vegetation. Now, monarchs are also threatened by deforestation in Mexico, particularly in Michoacan, where the trees that they depend on during migration are being cut down for lumber. In the United States, a national effort was put in motion for people to plant milkweed. President Obama used his leadership to further mobilize this effort. Conservation groups are trying to preserve the forest in Mexico for that part of their life cycle. Monarchs present a clear example of the complexity of habitat needs. As migratory animals, they must find their needed habitats all through their life cycle. Scientists often use nets to collect butterflies, but these nets are being used to collect something different. 
These are called D-nets for their shape. And these young people are collecting macroinvertebrates from Bear Creek in Medford. There are various methods of collecting them, but the goal is always the same, to loosen their grip on the undersides of the rocks and have the water sweep them into the net for observation and identification. Macroinvertebrates refer to those animals without backbones that spend their larva stage under the water. Plus, these animals are large enough to see without a microscope. This one is a case caddis fly, an indicator of good water quality. And macroinvertebrates include aquatic earthworms and the larva of mayflies and stoneflies. Since they look so similar, magnifiers are used to help distinguish those traits by counting appendages on the abdomens. Observers can identify the macros. Knowing what lives in a stream can tell scientists the quality of the water. That whole issue of water quality is critical to the health of salmon and steelhead populations, two fish that are vital to the health of the <laughs> ecosystem found in southern Oregon. 